On today's episode of Kilts of Culture with USA Kilts, we try Alexander Murray Ardlair Nine Year. No, bad. Back. <laughs> Howdy, boys and girls. Welcome to Kilted Culture. I am Rocky. This is Eric. Yo. Today, special treat. Our good friend, David Kemp, viewer of the show and customer, got us a bottle of Alexander Murray and Company Ardlair Nine Year. Uh, I've been very anxious to try this one. The other one he sent uh -huh. us was... Pretty damn good. He seems to know his stuff. Now, yes. this is nine year, so I guess some people would say it's not a real old. Well, it's different. Yeah, Just, correct. Okay. It's it's but, nine year. We'll but, we'll judge. Yeah, when we when we pop this baby, it's over. not good. I'm going to have words with Mr. Murray there. It's uh, yes, and yeah. his co. <laughs> so anyway. yes, sir. Having indeed, sampled indeed, your indeed. vitriol, we all know. Yes, yeah, actually, it's not a vitriol. Okay. That'd be food. Forgot anyway. to do the floor sliding. Oh, you forgot your yeah, trick today. I know. Yeah, um, I I've, well. I've failed us. Yeah. This table, this table needs a little. Oh, this, phew, this patching up there. Yeah, so it happens in the studio. We need an we need an authentic old, you know, Scottish. Uh, All right. Yeah, you know, handcrafted oak. Ooh, yes. Yeah. You know, thing. And I will pour it into our highly coveted off sought after USA kilts, blend carrying glasses. Ooh. Okay, just checking out the color. Looks pretty nice. Pretty pretty. All right, Mr. Mac. What would I, what would I get etched on whiskey glasses if I was gonna get custom etched whiskey glasses? What would I do? Uh, possibly just the word slanja. So, nah. Hey Mac, while you're here and on camera, mm -hmm. what tartan are you wearing today, buddy? I have on the um, red hackle tartan. <gasps> it's a. No, it's a red hackle day. It is. Mm -hmm. okay. It is the hackle of the red. It's like a red letter day, only better. Indeed, Mr. Eric, what do you yeah, have yeah. on there? Uh, Scott Red, Muted. Scott Red Muted. Yes, very nice. That's mm -hmm. lovely. I very much lovely. like this one. Yeah. And I am wearing, which you can't see behind our little table there. Um, I am wearing the McEwen Modern Tartan. It's one of my family-ish tartans. So family-ish, family-ish. Mm -hmm. Yes, and a through adoption. So black shirt day as well. It is. Yes, it always. Yes. Black shirt. Don't show no blood. Black shirt's all right. All right. I'm in mourning for my sobriety. Oh, oh yeah. I gotta put this back in so we can shed a nice pretty bottle. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. See, this is what happens. You delay a show by a couple of weeks and you get totally off your game. Oh, it's hectic. Forget everything. All right. Forget how everything's supposed to be. Why is it hectic? I don't Rocky, know. Rocky, what do we got going on? All kinds of stuff going on. All kinds of stuff. Indeed, indeed. We'll, 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 we'll tell them about that after mm -hmm. we're done this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. If they're good. If. All right. All right. So Mr. Mac. Tasting notes. And, and smell it. All right. Now, we didn't let it rest. We just opened the bottle, poured it right in. Yep. So we have to let it gas off a little bit. I'm going to swirl it around a touch, Not... try to move it around. Um, Color-wise, it's light. It's very light. Yep. Very, very, very thin legs. Well, I... Uh, well, yeah, yeah little, little thin legs. You're right. That's I'll agree. A... Um, medium light. I don't think it's... It's not... Is I, that is I've that an assessment lighter. of sugar content or something when you talk about the legs? Is that what that's for? Or is it just like people like saying, it, hey, yes, it has, it has legs, this one does. Well, I think it's partly that. You know, it's just like, hey, look, I know a word and a thing to say about scotch. <laughs> look at the legs. <laughs> um, now, it's it's partially, it's probably due to partially like the viscosity of it. If well, yeah, I had it totally to guess. is. I'm just wondering if it's sugars that yeah. cause the viscosity. Showing my ignorance, yeah. guys. Go ahead and correct me. Yeah, psh, we're all educating. Yeah. yeah. Um, scent. It's like fruity-ish and a little like beech woody or like something like a, a, a light wood. It smells like like a like like sawdust almost. Well, like let's say like light wood kind of. I don't know. I'm just not getting much of anything. I don't really. Yeah, it's very, there's very not there's light. not a lot. It's, it's a, very it's light. light. Very like a tiny tiny bit of oakiness. I think is what you're saying with the wood that you're picking up. Yeah, I'm just not. Yeah, it's. It's weird. Mac, what's the what am I smelling? So according to the sheet we'll that was printed off by our research department. <laughs> our professional whiskey research team. <laughs> um the highlighted section for me says sometimes big, brash, earthy, and smoky. Sometimes sometimes 
Sometimes. It's, it's sometimes. So it's like, yeah, it might be, might not be. This Depends bench. on the bottle. <laughs> wait, wait. wait. Up. Yeah, wait. You <laughs> have to no cover idea. your bases there, Murphy. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Murray, sorry. Sometimes florals and fruity. A real Jekyll and Hyde distillery. So they basically just what? put stuff in a barrel and see what happens. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. All right. At least they're honest. Slandra. <laughs> yeah. I get the earthy. I get the peat. Definitely get the peat. There's not much smoke. I don't really taste smoke, mm -hmm. but you mm -hmm. taste the, the, the earthy dirtiness kind iodine. of. Iodine. Yeah. It's literally iodine, right? Well, I don't know if it's literally iodine, but it's oh, yeah, it's similar ish. A little dry. Mac was like stuck there for a minute. I thought his game controller ran out of batteries. He was like. <laughs> it's all like on the front. For me, it's all like all on the front I was of the just tongue. Thinking that it's all on the front of the tongue. I, I purposely just tried to move it around a little bit and got a nice flavor on the in the center of my tongue. But still just very woody, very, very dry. I wouldn't say it. It said sometimes it's floral. Sometimes. Do we get the Jekyll or do we get the Hyde? I think I got the Hyde. <laughs> hmm. Trying something different since you said the front of the tongue thing. Put it in my mouth and I'm like wiggling my tongue around with the with the whiskey all around my tongue. Blah, Try to see if I can get it in different areas. Visual whiskey mouthwash. <laughs> The night after, when you have a hangover, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea. It has to tones of vintage Listerine from the nineteen yeah. fifties, you know. Yeah, I think we should let it breathe. I think it's. I think it's going to change in about ten minutes. When the when the full moon comes right, out, what you mean? Is it, is it Jekyll no, and Hyde? It's, it's going to change Jekyll the color and, and everything. Yes, like, indeed. It's Let's, purple. I'm going to try a touch touch of water. <laughs> like a minion. It, yeah. Like a minion. Yeah. yeah. It's it's not like real strong. In any one direction. It's kind of, it's like, it's strong, but not strong. I don't yeah. know. I feel like it wants to be a log of one when it grows up. It's just not yeah, quite but it, there, it, you know? Yeah, not... I, I wouldn't say it, it tastes, I'll say this. It doesn't taste cheap. Mm -mm. Um, But it's, yeah. it's just very... and I'm not sure what it's trying to do. I think it's very PD, but very simple. Yeah, just pour some pour some dirt and some rubbing alcohol. There you go. I, I you want I'd want to like pair this with something sweet, like a, a mild cheese or a very sweet pipe tobacco. Um, you know, it's just not. I would see a mild pipe tobacco. Yes, what I could see that. Smoke a pipe. Well, I smoked a pipe a long time ago, but okay. Okay. um, but like uh, something like mild and light. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. I don't know what kind of food I would pair it with necessarily. Um, I'm trying to help it. Ice cream? No. Some of smoked banshees. Smoked coop. Mm, <laughs> oh, no, that go. goes with everything. Well, that no, that because that's very very strong. Well, so, let's make it up for the smoke that's yeah, missing here. That's fair. Just think like a I would say a mild. Yeah. Something like a mild cheddar, or cheddar like makes that. it better. Wensleydale. With with. The rye seed triscuits, which nobody can freaking find anymore. Oh man, oh, man I love <laughs> rye triscuits. I love well, like rye crackers. Yes, yeah. general. And true, true. All right. Anyway, it's Kirk it's said chocolate. a little uninteresting. Hmm? Kirk said you could pair it with chocolate. It does, yeah, yeah. It's got it's got that kind of earthiness of a dark chocolate. Let me say that it's got that. Uh, okay. Okay, I can now see that, dark I mean, chocolate I mean, this is Mac, instead of milk. Mac and Kirk are leading the witness here, but sometimes it helps, actually. It gives him, you know, it's like a little bit of a tannic edge that reminds one of a dark coffee or dark cocoa. Yeah, I'm getting a little a burn. Oh, yeah, it's definitely a burn. Any more flavor notes, or did you just give us... That, that's all that I got. It? Okay. Uh, rich, nutty... Call it nutty. Bags nutty. of the Highland character. <laughs> did you say bags... Of Highland character, a real pick me up dram. Who the hell wrote this? <laughs> That's the... Fire the intern, guys! <laughs> wow, 
I'm sorry. Just speaking as a professional writer, I, I was like, say Eric's a copywriter. So oh, yeah. Bags of Scottish. bags. Great big satchels <laughs> of Highland. What? <laughs> It's like I'm trying to go for an innuendo, but I'm not even quite getting that right. And he has like, yeah. you know, bags of Scottish flavor. I, I, you know, it's just like, oh man, no, I don't <laughs> Taste mind it. My Scottish bags, know what I mean? I, I say no more. Um, no, I don't mind it, but yeah, it's one. It's, it, it is very, it's very, it's to to quote the uh, uh, to quote the great Ian. It's fine. It's fine. I don't hate it. I don't hate it. It's fine. Um, Apparently, everybody on TikTok thinks he sounds like Nicolas Cage. Did you catch that? Yeah. Hmm. Or Nick Offerman. Or Nick Offerman. Yeah. I, I could... Nick Cageman. Yeah, I could see the Nick Offerman a little bit more. Um, well, okay. <laughs> We're reviewing whiskey, not Ian's... Oh, yeah. Not Sorry. Ian's <laughs> anyway, stage voice, but... Okay. Ian's, Ian's one of his... Rocky, why don't lines. you give us your score? No, this isn't how it goes. It goes Mac first, okay. then you, All then right. me. Da -da. Okay. One, two, three. Come on! World is in chaos. He's going out of order. I cannot have it. All right, Mac. I I'm going right down the middle of the road. I'm going five. I'm not sure which way it wants to go, so I'm, therefore I'm not sure which way I want to go. That's a fair point. <laughs> yeah. Eric. Four point one. Really? If I were let's put it this way, if this, as you would say, if I were at a party and somebody offered it to me. Fine, especially for winter. Um, you know, feels like warming because the the peatiness and everything. But I, it, it, I'd rather have a log of one. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's like it can't make up its mind. Like almost like and like they knew that going in, and that's why they came up with the freaking Jekyll and Hyde description. So yeah, I'm not super impressed. It's not bad. It's just not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll go five eight. Really? It's hmm. it's I'm I'm right there with Mac where it's it doesn't know what it wants to be. I like I wish you wouldn't have said that because I was gonna say it. <laughs> it doesn't know what it you wants did the to same be. Thing to me. But it's very it's very good for for middle of the road. There's nothing strong and crazy out of whack. A little bit on the peat, but it's still not. It's still reasonable and tolerable. It it feel, um, it feels like it's one of the ones you would give somebody to get them started. Yes. I don't know if you know I like mean? Isla Scotches or not, so let me try something like this. It's got a little peatiness to it, not really almost right. any smoke, and that way it'll kind of introduce them without overpowering them. Yeah. Um, yeah. You could say the same thing for the Open, frankly. Um, yeah, but I like the Open better. Yeah, so much. Um, <laughs> obviously. Oddly. The um, so yeah, I'd say five eight. It's still it's still good. I wow. I would like okay. it. Um, it's it's above average, but not a ton because there's not. It's just it's just. Average. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's so like it's it's, it's got the peatiness well done, but there's nothing to go with it. Yeah, it's it's I think it's, that's the thing. There's nothing else there's not there's no other interest to it. Yes. That. Yes. Here here's my own thing. Mm, mm, <laughs> flail all over the place. <laughs> Watch out. It's it's it, it's it wants to be balanced, but there's nothing to balance it out. Like yeah. it's a good amount of peat. Right. Then what else? Uh you know, stuff. Like, mm -hmm. but it's nothing like nothing on the other side of the seesaw, right? Floral jekylls and chocolate hides, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. yeah. If you have to add something to it to like? make it better, like the chocolate thing, meh. Twenty minutes later, um, I would increase my score retroactively to let's say six, eight, or seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're just doing it straight up, or with the. A, little, a little yeah. wee drop of water. Mr. Kemp, thank you ever so much again for your gifts. Absolutely. Uh, these, these have always been interesting. Yeah. It's thank just, everybody. Who, yeah. All that stuff back there. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. It's going to be all bottles. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, nuts. please, please, don't send us more. Don't send us more scotches. We, we hate when it happens. Yes. Don't be greedy. Indeed. Me? Never. All right. All right. And Away with you. Whoop. No, move the leg. Yeah, practice. All right, there we go. Yeah, right. I know. I just don't care that much. All right. <sighs> there. Now, thank you very much, boys and girls. Please load in your questions. As always, we are your humble servants here to answer all of your kilt and culture related questions. While you load them in and Mr. Mac starts gathering all the questions from the audience. Just one side note uh, before we jump into the first question. Our uh, good friend of the show, uh, Jeffrey Withnell, is watching us from the hospital. Oh. So. Oh, uh, right. I hope you're doing all right. Yeah. You know what happened? 
Uh, this he's was... uh, post uh, surgery, so oh, yeah. Well, so, I think this was in the this was speedy a while recovery coming. to you, Jeff. Yeah, we miss you. All right, now before we start the show, a couple things. One, we're starting a, a thing that we did a couple months so far, so we haven't forgotten yet. Um, we are going to do what the answers were to the question of the day from last month, mm -hmm. or question of the month from last <clears> month. <throat> so, top three answers in no particular order. Uh, what was the question? Question was, what are your travel plans this summer, and will you be in a kilt? So, 23 Firebird. My brother and I are riding the Sturgis, South Dakota this August, and I'll be wearing a kilt for the concerts at the Buffalo Chip. Given as a biker bar, or biker rally, excuse me, I'll be in a utility kilt as a traditional kilt, I think will feel out of place, but that's just me. Hey, I've seen I tread think... kilts with leather jackets and stuff all the time, yeah. so I think that's fine. But... Yep. <clears throat> but, utility kilt. Fine Sounds fun. It does. Sounds like prime kilt lifting territory, though. Very, very much so. <clears throat> um, Reverend Zimich. Uh, we're traveling back from running PA. Hope you had fun in PA. Um, and I was kilted. Every trip we've taken since I started wearing kilts, I don't even take pants anymore. I usually take a semi-trad and a wool kilt and wear a casual to traveling. That's awesome. Nice. Very good. Very good. Spreading the kilt love around the country. Mm -hmm. Last one, Mike Simpson. I'm so chuffed my question got read out loud and answered. For the hike up to Inpin, I have a law enforcement memorial casual that I bought last year. As the hike is sponsored event to raise funds for the UK pol uh, police charity Care of Police Survivors, which gives aid to families of fallen officers here, it makes perfect sense to take and wear that kilt for the Inpin. What what question do we ask? Oh, yeah, he was... Um, yes, I do. He was the guy who... Uh, he asked us about... Uh, <clears throat> Dealing with wearing a kilt for hiking on a number of different levels, like A, like practicality of it, and B, okay. dealing with the fact that the person he was going with wasn't thrilled with the idea. Yep, yep, yep. And I C, remember. wondering what kind of reactions he might get from people he met. Awesome. So, like, basically the whole, just our thoughts on the whole process. Now, yeah. um, Inpin is apparently a very, very challenging climb, I've since learned. So, be careful, please. <laughs> Don't um, fall. But it's interesting. I, I had no idea he was doing it for a charity. He never mentioned that part yeah. of it in the original uh question so i think it's even more interesting that he's doing it and it's even cooler he's doing the kilt because now he's got like you know different he, layers yeah they might get some attention that way and that means yeah. he can spread the message and all that so that's cool yep a good kilt ambassador as exactly were. Yeah. awesome congratulations okay next second special announcement hmm. can you believe mac can you believe eric can, adam can you believe it's been Adam's like, nope, can't believe it. <laughs> it's been all it's almost been five years, five, since we started this. Um That's August insane. 2017. No, 16. Oh, uh, whatever. Yeah. Something's five years. Uh, it's been five, <laughs> we did the math earlier, it's fine. The 17, yeah. 17. Sorry. August 17. August 2017, 2017 yep. was our first live show middle of august 2017 mm -hmm. um please don't look at the footage it's horrible the show is very, using the term very yeah. loosely um so we are going to do a five-year anniversary show august 19th yep um we're going to kind of open up and do something different it's not going to be the normal show like we do it here where we're answering questions about kilt related stuff we're going to open it up to Questions about the company, questions about us, questions about the, the show, about the Facebook, about everything. We're just going to go a little crazy and do something different. Is it AMA? Is that what you call it? Yeah, an AMA and ask me anything ask kind me of anything. thing. Um, this within, is Within reason. Even without reason. We just won't answer you. Um, it's true. The, um, but if you want to you know, join us for that, mark your calendars. We'll do something on a, uh, a post about it on the Facebooks yeah. and the Instagram. Trying to remind people. Yeah. Um, but middle of August, five-year anniversary show. We're gonna have some cool little little bits that we're gonna have in there as well. So bits and bobs, bits and or bobs. August nineteenth, be there, be there, be there. Friday, Friday, Friday. Your ticket pays for the whole seat, but you only need the edge. So. Okay. Anyway, thank you for enduring all that, um, Mr. Eric. What? What question? What are we gonna lead off the show? Oh, okay. Question. Lead question is: Are you going to be there on August nineteenth? That's a great That's question. Lead question. Okay. <clears throat> First question is from Joe Gauss. What's the deal with the quake? I had a drink of whiskey offered to me in one at a Highland Festival by a clan representative. 
I understand it's a welcoming slash friendship tradition, but what's the story behind the quake? What's the deal? What's the deal with the quake? Um, it's basically it's a cup of welcome. So you pour in. Well, I'm not gonna pour this. Um, <laughs> you pour scotch into the quake. And there's two handles, so you can hand it to the other person. Mm -hmm. um, it's a shared cup kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There's not a. What else is there to say about it? So glad you asked. Um, Lovely. The origins of where this came from are actually kind of mysterious. The um, there is a tradition that it definitely was a Highland thing first. Okay, it didn't become it yeah. wasn't didn't catch on in any of the lowlands until like the 18th century and early 19th century. Surprise, surprise. Um, like so many other things. Um, the there was a story that it started from Highlanders using um, shells, like scallop shells, to drink whiskey out of. But it's since uh, been thought that that only was a reference to a passage in the Osin sagas, which are okay. those the fake those fake yeah, uh, yeah. Celtic, uh, Celtic Homeric Gallic epics kind of thing. epic yeah. poems of which were actually kind of fake. Um, so that was one story. There is a possibility that it was um, the idea came from bleeding bowls from England, which I find very odd. But there's still an entry in an encyclopedia somewhere like. Uh, like Encyclopedia Britannica, circa 1914, tried to say, "Oh yes, well they got the idea from bleeding medieval bleeding bowls used in England and and Wales." And a bleeding bowl is basically what you'd catch blood in when you were, you know, being a barber surgeon. Yeah, well, not killing somebody, but bloodletting well, for, yes, for healing. Yeah. yeah, that seems stupid to me. Um, there is evidence that um, other cultures on the continent did have bowls like this, and there is a there is some that come from the Baltic, which are made the same way with the handles. And with the original construction, which is kind of like uh, staves of wood, like a barrel, which is how you make a traditional quake. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. how you. That's how like the old, old, old archaeological specimens are like that. The silver stuff came later. Um, so I think it was brought into the Highlands by uh, Nordic settlers in the area. I think it was probably a, a drinking vessel that came over with the people coming on the boats. Dun dun dun. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay. And I personally, and I don't have a basis for this, but it, it's. Now, um, how sure are you of this? Is this... The, I know those drinking vessels exist. Okay. There, there are specimens from the Middle Ages of um, double-handled, wood-stave-constructed drinking vessels. From, Nordic. From the Baltic. Okay. Right. Um, and then I know that there's... Um, I know it's from the Highlands. I think I, the medieval... It was the bowl that was used elsewhere and just came north, like other things, like from England. Right. Eh. Um, the shell thing is almost certainly a myth. Because there's no evidence of that prior to um, the the Osin poems in the 18th century, and uh, it's just a, it's 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 a gut feeling. Okay. That last part is purely speculation on my part. That's that's where I'm trying to get to is what is what is fact and what is speculation. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's my my and I know that um, from my experience with Scandinavian traditions or anything, then the whole idea of passing a horn around as a as a token shared, of yeah. of shared toasting. Um, was a thing, and I feel like the bowl was in place of a drinking horn in some in some capacity. Okay. Yeah, you know, because it's not just necessarily somebody coming to your house, but you pass it from person to person to person, going around in a circle. You know, and the handles just make it easier for doing that. You okay. Know? So, don't know, don't know. It's definitely related to things like porridgers. Um, there's also a sami bowl, which only has one handle, but it's the same kind of a, a deal. You know who the sami are? Sure. Let's pretend I do. <laughs> Um, Sami, Sami are native peoples in, in like Norway and <clears throat> Finland. So, okay. So, um, Laplanders. Okay. So I think, it, I think it's one of those small things that came over and nobody knows exactly when, but the tradition definitely developed and really caught fire in the 18th and 19th century. Yeah. Yeah. It became, it became a poetic romantic expression then. Yeah. Prior to that, it was probably still had some traditions attached to it, but was a little bit more practical, less ostentation, ostentatious. Yeah, now it's it's more the symbolism that is in it. Than yeah, like I think people yeah. would probably use one to welcome to their home on a regular basis back in the old days, but but you know slowly but surely it just became much more ritualized, and then it became paying the piper at the wedding, and then doing the thing with the bride and the groom at the wedding, and people don't yep. use them very often except at weddings anymore. So yeah. the fact that his clan chief or clan representative offered him a drink out one is awesome. You know, I, I'd Agreed. it'd be great if more people were bring, more people were doing more of it. Agreed. Maybe not but. during COVID. But no, no, probably yeah, not. Indeed. You have disposable quakes. You just have like a, a liner. You just drink out of it and then just toss the liner and refill it. 
Uh, yeah, but you have to get all of it out. Well, I don't know. Okay. But anyway, yeah, it's not... It's an old tradition, but nobody knows exactly how old. That's what yeah. it comes down to. Indeed. Yeah. Hope that helped. Mr. Mac. All right. So our first question comes from the YouTube. We have Devil Dog 2008 Any advice for measuring for your kilt with a food sensitivity? Sometimes the bloat can be pretty extreme. More than three inches difference in his waist at times. Interesting. Food sensitivity, meaning he moves in and out yeah. with what he's eating. Kind he of expands thing. and contracts. Yeah. Hmm. Um, sure. Here's what I would do. If you have some kind of condition where if you eat, it's, it all you know stays right here. And then, you know, if you haven't eaten for a while, it, you know, it goes in. I would do this. I would measure your waist and your hips multiple times over multiple days. Mm. So I'd say measure yourself, you know, before breakfast and then an hour, hour after breakfast, you know, before lunch, two hours after lunch, before dinner, two hours after dinner, and do that for a couple days in a row. It's a bit of a pain, but what I'm trying to do is get your average. So if you're measuring multiple times and sometimes you're as small as 36 and other times you're as big as 39, then I would probably say, okay, do maybe a 37 and a half. Split the difference and order right down the middle. That way it's, you know, it's still, the, the straps on a, on a kilt generally span about two and a half or three inches. So, and most kilt makers will make it to the middle hole or try to make it to the middle hole in the strap. So if you're shooting, you know, shooting for the the extreme small and the extreme large, and you want to go right in the middle of that, it'll it'll fit a little bit better. Now, let's say you're wearing a kilt out for the day, and you say, okay, well, you know, it's you get up in the morning, and you know, there's nothing in your system, and you strap on your kilt, and you're all the way on the tightest one, and then after breakfast and after lunch, you know, you've had a heavy meal and start to blow it out a little bit and it feels too snug, then you can just let it out a notch or two in the straps. Um, and that should help you through the day. Mm -hmm. That would be my, my thoughts on it. It's kind of what I was going to say. I would, I would probably err on the side of the larger measurement. Um, not that I would wish that you would suffer a food allergen attack, but, you know, if you can have a sense of, of your measurement when you're at the worst point of that condition, go with that because you can always tighten it up, but you don't want it to be... Uh, you know, so tight that you can't wear it comfortably. Yeah. Now, if it's a matter of, like, suddenness or, like, you're out and about and you can't predict when it's going to happen or something like that, um, you know, like, my wife has this issue, like, with the restaurants and stuff a lot of time. You know, she can get schnookered by depending on what she orders at a restaurant. Um, then, yeah, again, I think having it larger so you can tighten it down is good or let it out. The average would be good. I'm tempted to say if it's extreme, like, really extreme, then maybe consider pairing the kilt with a set of braces so you can wear it loose you know, if it's like if it's a formal occasion, yeah. let's say, and you're going to be at this huge dinner <clears throat> and you don't know what's going to happen, maybe have something so you can you can have it loose. It's not putting pressure on you. Yep. Making you uncomfortable. I mean, you don't want to be out for the day in a kilt and all of a sudden feel like you have to take the kilt off because you're dying. Yeah. You know, so. I agree. Yeah. Hope that helps. Yeah. All right, Mr. Stay Eric. Healthy. My turn already. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. All right, Charles Marx commented that he was recently appointed the officially unofficial Toastmaster for the Caledonian Society of Arizona. I don't know that one. I'm curious about that. Um, aside from the as good as you are toast, what are your favorite Scottish toasts suitable for gatherings? I think we could expand it to Gallic toasts. Yeah. Sometimes you remember... <clears throat> I don't, I know a few toasts. I don't, I don't toast often outside of like Slangeva. Um, and I know my insulting style ones that I absolutely love. Um, the only, and I'm, and I'm horrible at memorizing. So all the toasts I know have to be short. <laughs> hmm. Um, the one that sticks in my mind and I don't think it's Scottish. It's probably Irish. Um, is may you live as long as you want. And never want as long as you live. That would be my That's heartfelt good one. That's a good toast one. that I like. Cool. I guess I should have a glass for that, man. Yes. So, yeah. Cheers. I'll Cheers. drink to that. Yeah. It didn't. <laughs> okay. Do you have a toast? Ish. Um, I mean, I have 
Bam may the road rise to meet your face. That's yeah, your that's thing. my that's my joke one. It's like may the road rise to meet your face. Um, the uh, my dad always used to say next year in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, my my official family toast has nothing to do with Scottish Gaelic culture. It's you know garachki, which the family tradition says translates from the ancient word for that with which you open the door to the garage. Um, but the the Scottish one I like is let's see if I can remember it. Uh, may those who live true always be believed, and those who deceive us always be deceived. I don't like that one, especially these days. So, yeah, yeah, I'll so. test that. <laughs> yeah, bing, the old clinking show. Mm -hmm. Mac, knowing that you're over there doing something else, I'm going to ask you anyway. Do you have any particular toasts that you like or don't like? You figured, you know, you are history nut. You may have something oh, that's a good weird point. and different. I just like mine with butter and jelly. <sighs> Near butter you always, that was always be jellied. <laughs> the, the dad joke is strong with this one. Okay. I was just, I was like toasting the regiment. Yeah, you know, even though yep. I'm not in any regiments, but you know, just like, you know. and Indeed. and you know, and the queen. I will, I will, I will toast the queen. But yes, don't at me. Yeah, the one, the one that I find amusing, and I won't say, well, yeah, they're in, in, in a particular group, when they, when they toast, they toast to specific things, and one of the toasts that they give is to the president, and knowing that members of the group are right or left-leaning, if you disagree with the current president, or you're not fond of the current president, people will reply with, to the office, as opposed to, to the mm -hmm. president. So... Well, that's it's a it's a neat humble way of saying you know yes I respect the office not the man. Yeah, I think yeah. And there's similar things like um, toasting the crown as opposed to the person who's wearing the crown is, is an old world version of that. Um, I had another one now I forgot about it. Dang it! Sorry. Oh, um, Jacobite toasts were a thing. Um, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, I don't remember a lot of them specifically, but or the words of them because some of them got very very poetic and involved. But it basically you know it's like here you know to the <clears throat> king over the water. Yep. You know, or to he who's gone and may yet return, or you know, or shall not or who he who had to leave and shall never return. Um, and then there's the secret version of doing it where you have the toast and you toast the king, but you have it over a bowl of water, so that you're actually symbolically silently saying the king over the water, meanly meaning you know the old pretender, but nobody could say you're not toasting the king, meaning the Hanoverian king. So Indeed. very 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 snaky, <laughs> but uh, but those are always cool. Yes. And that, that's where you get almond glasses and all that cool stuff from. Yep, so. yep, yep. Did we do a video on almond glasses? We did. We did yeah. a video on almond glasses. And uh, I, yeah. think, I think secret Jacobite practices are fascinating. Some of the art yeah. they produced to keep keep the faith, so to speak, was amazing. Yeah, a lot of the symbolism that they had, and even in the toasting, like you said, like at the, over the bowl yeah, the of water. Yeah, the king over the water. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's 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 neat and fun to to see and know. Yeah. And and Robbie Burns. Robbie Burns has a, a lot of his lines get used for toasts also. And this, yep. and, and I... The Selkirk Grace is not really a toast, but my dad always used to say that, you know, for Thanksgiving and other special occasions. That was his favorite for those occasions. Nice. So, Indeed. Uh, Hope so, that helps. Yeah. It's fun to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Mack, who do we got on the interwebs out there? Well, <clears throat> this just in from TikTok. <gasps> from <gasps> TikTok? <laughs> so we have Sarah Pettigrew saying, hi from the Scotland... Or hi from the Scottish Island. Ah, why do you call it Scotch instead of whiskey? We call it whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> the um, personally, I call it, yeah, just call it whiskey. But it's we sometimes we say Scotch, sometimes we say whiskey. Um, it's to us there's different things, and it's it's kind of just the way that Americans just it comes out when we're saying Scotch. We're specifically talking about whiskey from Scotland versus Irish whiskey versus like bourbon from Kentucky and things like that. So yeah. it's it's our way of saying that like this particular type of whiskey versus that particular type. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, it, there's nothing meant rude or weird about it, and it's just a uh, what's the old phrase? You know, a a common people divided by language or something. I don't. I think it's. Uh, I'll I'll give a potentially controversial answer, but it's actually the reason some people call it Scotch is because the Scots for a time called it scotch 
this being the reason. Scotch is an archaic and no longer accepted or really enjoyed term for Scottish people. But at the time when whiskey was making its way out of the UK and out of Scotland, especially, they needed to be able to differentiate themselves from weaker, less desirable products, the competition. So it's kind of like the same reason why you can say a bubbling wine or a sparkling wine is a sparkling wine. It's only champagne if it comes from champagne. The term scotch was applied to Scottish whiskey for a long time for the same reason. It's like, no, 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 no. This isn't any of that crap you're used to drinking. This is scotch. This Take is that special. Ca- it's this not is- that Canadian swill. Or that Irish Kinda. crap. Yeah, or that, that that weird American stuff made with corn. Ugh. You know, it's so it was it was kind of like it was an old archaic, and we're talking like 200 years old or more, marketing technique. It's like, you know, trying to say, no, this is the real deal. So that's kind of where it started, as far as I know. Um, like Tweed versus Harris Tweed and things like that. Too. Yeah, and it's like, yeah. I won't fault people for saying it. Um, if they decide they're into it, then it's like, you know, it's actually better to call it whiskey. You know, and then, then you get into the spelling thing, like the, you know, it, E-Y it, or the Y. E-Y yeah. is Irish and just Y is Scottish. And yeah. So, um, but that's in a long-winded nutshell. That's what I understand about it. Yes. No matter what, it's good. Scotch so eggs are not Scottish, by the way. <laughs> good to know. No, they're not. That's, I... that, that comes up, that comes up a lot. It's actually, it's, it comes from the term scotched, which means minced. And it was actually supposedly invented by this coach house restaurant in England back in the late 18th century. But uh, I think they stole the idea from what peasants were doing and workers were doing all the time. And they just got the idea of selling it to passengers and therefore made it famous. Yeah, my, my scotched eggs are actually an English invention. Tangent. My mind was blown when I found out that shepherd's pie was not Irish. It was actually English mm-hmm. and of origin. I... I psh- still no haggis was not originally scottish either it's a question of who came up with the idea and who did it best so So, yeah same thing like with tartan it's not you know there's been examples of crisscross threads for hundreds and thousands of years yeah but the scots perfected it yeah so it's now it's you know officially scottish tartan yeah exactly Uh, indeed not plaid scottish tartan right all right i hope that helps but plaid's That's, similar. Like yeah. you, sometimes you have to you gently correct people when they say, like, "Oh, I want to know what my family plaid is." And it's like, well, actually, the term you want is tartan. And I think the scotch and whiskey thing is kind of a similar thing. So yeah. it's like you know they don't mean any harm, but it's good to educate them to nicer yeah. vocabulary. And I still, I'm raising my hand on this. Like I still say scotch, two thirds of the time, probably, if not more, just, just because say, it's I usually yeah. say whiskey. Yeah. But unless I'm quoting Anchorman, in which case it's like scotchy, scotch, scotch, scotch. But yeah, a true. horrible movie. Oh, it's great. Don't at me. me. Oh, come at me. That's oh. my that's my line for the whole show is gonna be don't at me. <laughs> is it my turn now? Sure. Okay. All right. Hold on. How there? Let me pour more scotch. Scotch whiskey. You or bas- just whiskey. You bastard. Uh, how dare I? You Philistine. How dare I, sir? You ignorant colonial. I know, I'm gonna spill it all over myself. Damn too. Yankee. See it's I, I don't mind it as much now. I'm gonna if I hate that I already scored it. Okay. I it has gotten go sweeter. Out. Yeah. As typically happens. Yeah. I still don't think it's very exciting though. I I agree, but it's, it's kind of right. mellowed out a little bit. I would yeah. I would increase. Now we don't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I would increase my score retroactively to let's say six, eight, or seven. It's it's wow. Meaning it's I'm still not driving to go get it, but it's fine. I don't mind it. There you go. He's okay. It's fine. He's okay. Um, before I launch into yet yeah, another rabbit hole tangent that has nothing to do with Gal- Gallic uh, culture, um, Craig Moore, this is more <clears throat> of the practical side of stuff. Um, I want to wear a kilt all summer and at the beach. Stone Harbor crowd will probably be critical, I'm thinking. Uh, however, I think the Outer Banks families will just be curious. What's your recommended recommended kilt? fabric, and kit for going on vacation and including beaches. We've been asked this one a couple of times lately because of, you know, summer vacation coming up. Yeah. Um, if you're going to wear it on the beach, it, it my go-to would be a casual Velcro type kilt because it is lighter weight fabric. It is, you know, you can get your swimming trunks on or off underneath it. Um, you don't have to worry about it being 
too hot or, or you know, wool being screwed up and that kind of thing. So I would say a PV casual kilt and a lighter yeah. shirt. Yeah. Yeah. See, I'm not a I'm not a beach person, so I can't really comment on the difference between the Outer Banks or Stone Harbor. Um, I don't know what. what yeah, yeah. I guess he's either. saying that some of them are snobby and some of them aren't. Whatever, it's their problem. You don't have to talk to them. They don't have to look at you. Um, I would say if you're on the beach and it's totally casual just for vacation, then yeah, it's minimalistic. It's not being traditionalist. It's you're just having fun and being comfortable. Um, but once you're away from the beach, I would try to look nice. You know, especially if you're in an area where you want to be not the, the ugly tourist. You want to look like, you know, gentlemanly tourist. Then, you know, don't do not do the Hawaiian shirt and kilt thing, you know. Please don't. Please, please no. Yeah. No. So. The, but, you know, a, a polo, like a business casual kind of thing. Polo with kilt. And, yeah. you know, nice or we, we've said before, um, I think the, uh, some of the, uh, the, the Sun Guard, uh, very, very light linen, light cotton shirts. Can look nice with a kilt it could be good for a tropical environment or you know going to a restaurant in the evening where you're dining on the patio you know and the ocean yes. waves are crashing you know uh, candlelight uh, you know indeed that'd be nice lovely <laughs> <laughs> i smell the steak <laughs> fine fine <laughs> away from my fries <laughs> but uh yeah i mean it, it comes down to yeah the beach and the rest of the vacation are separate that's how i would think of it yeah isn't Kakao like a, cr- a crow? Yeah, I, that's why I changed it. Yeah. Way through. I, okay. It's... <laughs> Too much for sea scotch. I, I appreciated your, your seagull, though. That was nice. <laughs> you know, I've always been amused by the fact that whenever you hear a bald eagle, it's actually a red It's actually hawk. a red tailed yep. hawk. Yep. And we have those like crazy around here. We are in total red hawk, red tailed hawk country. So, <laughs> yes. It's another eagle. Yeah. No. Indeed, it's not. All right. Mr. Mac, what do we got next? All right. So this question from YouTube. Comes for Nathan, and he's getting married, so he's looking for some advice here, real quick. Okay, real quick, real quick. Hurry, I gotta, I gotta be fast. So he's getting married next. Oh, it's the next March, so he's got a little time. Okay, it's not and that a, fast. And, Good. A, and, a be- and to his beautiful fiance, mm-hmm. um, who isn't in the kilts. Uh oh. So for the ceremony, he'll be wearing slacks, but during his reception next kilt, is this a good idea as a compromise? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'd say so. The <clears throat> weddings are about the union of the two and making sure both of you are happy with the day. Um, the it's not I've, I've, I've hated the the insinuation that it's her day. You do what she wants kind of thing. It's no, it's you're starting a life together. It should be both of your day. Um, I'm, I'm I think I'm quoting Monty, one of our mods in our Facebook group, who said that. Marriage is not 50-50. Marriage is 100-100. It should be you trying to make the other person happy and them trying to make you happy. It should be both. That is the secret to a happy marriage. And I love that quote from him. So, yes, finding a compromise, especially on that day, is is a good thing to do. The majority of the photos are going to be at the altar and right after that and, you know, as you're walking out of the church and things. So, having that if she has a particular thing in her mind of this is how I envision that day, then I appreciate that and that's fine. And her being willing to compromise and say, you know what, but I know it means something to you and I think that we should be able to like enter the, you know, enter the reception. A, you're going to get a big standing round of ovation. Well, A, because you're married, but B, because I hope so. <laughs> also, because you're wearing the kilt, and especially yeah. if you get like her a sash or something to bring her into it a little bit after like the vast majority of the pictures are done, just to show like, hey, this is a fun new thing. It's going to like up the ante of the reception itself and kind of set the tone for now. It's the fun time. Yeah. So I like the idea as a compromise. I still I still like kilts for formal. I wore mine for the wedding itself, of course. But as a compromise. It's not a bad compromise. Yeah, I think it sounds pretty good. I mean, the hard thing to remember that we always mention in these situations is that it may be her personal preference. It may also be that she's dealing with the preferences of those in her family. And, you know, you want them to be comfortable and uh, not feel awkward during the ceremony also. I mean, it's about you guys, not them. But you want to be a good host. So there's something to that. And uh, it's about building harmony for that moment. 
uh, I think that indeed you'll definitely get more of a, a reaction and, and more of a fun reaction from people during the reception. The kilt, you know, people will definitely appreciate the kilt. And there'll be a lot of pictures. Um, the other thought would be, I mean, if you are feeling left out somehow, um, are there other Celtic-y kind of things you're adding to the ceremony that you can do even if you're not wearing the kilt? You know, there's people who do, um, you know, like the, the, the sash thing, regardless of whether there's a kilt or not. There's other traditions you can incorporate that would give you a nice old world, you know, Scottish, Irish, what have you, flair. Uh, and meaning without uh, actually wearing that particular garment. So hopefully there's some elements that would make it colorful and, you know, more meaningful for you in the moment. Yeah, you know, more aesthetically pleasing, because obviously it's going to be meaningful. It's a marriage. Yeah. But no, I think I think just by the fact that you're uh, you're both willing to compromise yeah. right out of the gates is a very good sign. So, yep. you know, to your Absolutely. marriage. Yeah. Congratulations. Lang me your lumreek. Exactly. Oh, that's my other favorite toast, but that's only for, you know, okay. Yeah. Lang me your lumreek. Exactly. Yeah. Cheers. Bonjour. All right, Mr. Eric. I think, I think I think we should have a rule on the show where we only drink when people make us toast something and they have to tell us what we're toasting. No, I want to drink more than that. <laughs> I think you don't I think you're underestimating their capacity to come up with stupid stuff for us to don't drink to. Mac would be like, hey, here's another drinking one. Yeah. <laughs> Every time yet... Mac has a question from the audience, we drink. Yet yet another. Yet another. Okay. Um All right. So this is an interesting one, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of backstory as we go to make sure that we're clear on this. But okay. the basic question is this. Uh friend and viewer Chris McFight. Uh, said, gentlemen, I've watched your previous videos about the owning and wearing of different kilts from different clans. We've talked about that many times, you know, that mm -hmm. it's okay to have wearing multiple yep. lines of heritage. However, my question is this. Should I feel uncomfortable wanting to own and wear the tartan of a rival clan? So his story basically is that his main lineage is that he's a McPherson, uh, but he recently found out that way, 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 way back on his great-great-grandmother's side, they were actually McGregors, and then changed their name to Gregory in the 17th century because the name McGregor was prescripted against. You could be put to death if you didn't renounce the name. So they did it for very serious reasons at the time. Hence the great McGregor despite them. Exactly, motto, yeah. exactly. And, and them being the outlaws. So he, he loves that part of his heritage. He loves the, uh, the McGregor Tartans. He'd like to wear one, but he's worried that people are going to be upset or weird about it if he's wearing um, literally a rival clan. Not just that the McGregors were outlaws, but apparently the McPhersons and the McGregors were like blood enemies. McLarens or McPhersons? Uh, McLaren. Sorry. McLaren. Okay. We'll just dub that in when I say, or I say McPherson, I'll be like, McLaren. Um, he's a McLaren. And the McLarens and the McGregors apparently were blood enemies for a long time so he's afraid of what reaction he'll get if he wears the tartan of the enemy even though he's related to both <clears throat> i would i would say this um the americans a it was it was bloop, a it was quite a long time ago the the people that tend to get fussed about these things are generally not the scots unless they're like historians or they were direct descendants of something or it's like they're directly linked to it. It is several hundred years ago. It's not like they're they're physically it was it wasn't last weekend that their buddy got shivved by a by a McGregor and he's a McLaren. Um so it's A, it's a long time ago. B, Scots really aren't too fussed about it. They're talking about old traditions and old, you know, old timey stuff versus what they're doing today. Americans who are obsessed with the history about the things and trying to make sure that they're not doing something mm -hmm. incorrect mm -hmm. are the ones, or that they're doing things properly, are the ones who tend to get more animated about these things. Mm -hmm. So it, both of these things are your heritage, McGregor and McLaren. So I wouldn't worry about it. We've said before, I wouldn't mix the tartans, like, but that's anything, whether they're you know, blood yeah. enemies or not. Right. It's, I wouldn't wear a Stuart tie and a Campbell kilt, whether they're enemies or not. It just, it looks weird. Um, 
the because you're not honoring really either you're kind of dishonoring both by wearing more than one is yeah. my you know two cents on the right, matter right um but it's not that big of a deal you know now as long as you're you know a respectful you know student of the culture and you're wearing it respectfully and you're honoring your own personal heritage and you're not trying to pass something off that you're not it's yeah do do what you want to do within that that being said i'd wear one or the other at any given time um, i right. wouldn't wear them both at the same time no most scots no. that i know pick like the, well i have my mom's last name and my dad's last name this is the one i like better this is the one i'm going to wear right. period so and they just wear that's their tartan they don't generally have more than one kilt right um your thoughts i think you said this before um and and i've i've kind of said before too that i mean what do you think are really the the odds of you walking down the street or walking into a Highland Games event and wearing a, you know, a McGregor tartan, one of them, and uh, and somebody coming up to you and realizing you're a McLaren and saying, "What have you done?" and and pulling out their broadsword and you know hacking at you. I mean, or getting oh, into a fist fight. I mean, I mean, it, it's yeah. I mean, is there somebody in? He mentioned he's active with the McLaren Clan Society of North America. It's like. Is there somebody in society who you mentioned this to and they're like, blah, 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 don't do that. Yeah, it's like, you know, um, they need to get over themselves. Um, I think most people would consider it to be silly. And quite conversely, they consider it to be a fascinating point of conversation. I mean, it's basically, you know, cl tribalism and clan rivalries are universal across the human experience. And if you're an enlightened person, you have to accept the fact that we've moved on from that. And there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that it happened and understanding and appreciating the history. And I think, you know, it's like, I mean, do Campbell's and McDonald's actually have fistfights in the streets because of Glencoe? I don't think Still? so. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, it's, uh, well, and that's all, that's a whole complicated story anyway. It um, is, but it's, it's, but understanding the history, understanding where it fits in to history, understanding the surrounding context of everything, yeah. and then kind of leaving it at a certain point and moving, recognizing mm -hmm. that people have moved on and moved forward. Yeah. Here's my uh, here's my parallel. Last week in West Virginia, were the Hatfields and the McCoys still feuding? Mm -hmm. uh, no, they've moved on. It's okay. We think. Let it go. It's are there still people? You know, Hatfields, McCoys, you know, Campbell's, McDonald's, whatever, who still hold a grudge. You know, the Scots are never known to hold a grudge. Um, <laughs> are there still some people who hold a grudge or still talk about it? Yes, there are still people who talk about it. And that's how you bring history forward. And that's how you keep history in the zeitgeist. And it's it's important to continue talking about things. But there, most people, uh, kind of as you said, have just kind of like, oh, it's it used to be a thing. And it's kind of fun to just joke about now, but it's no longer right, right. really a thing. So right. don't worry your pretty little head about it. It's okay. You are both. You are a McLaren and you are a McGregor. You can wear both and wear them proudly. As again, I wouldn't do them simultaneously, but you're fine to do it. That's just uh, that's just proper, you know, clan Clan etiquette, etiquette yeah. basically, yeah. Or like, etiquette. The closest I've ever come is exactly that. It's like I, I have some Campbell in my in my background on my grandmother's side, and I've once or twice had a McDonald come into the store and and we joke about it. It's like, ah, oh, you bastard, you know. But it's all it's just we're yeah. just, just kidding around. Yeah, you know, there are much much more important things to be concerned with in yeah. this in this day and age. It, yeah, so. with, <laughs> with with wars, with famine, with <laughs> food shortages, yeah. with like you know disease, yeah. with all of it. Are we really still concerned that a couple hundred years ago, some McGregors and some McLarens didn't get on? If if you're really, you know, if, if that is the biggest thing that you are concerned about, your eyes aren't open. So, honestly, don't worry about it. Move forward. Yeah. He's already taken the first step because he knows the history. Yeah, exactly. I, mean, I think that's, that's a bottom line is, you know, we always say be a sincere student. So, you know your clan's history. I'm assuming he's learned quite a bit about the McGregors and then the Gregories. So you're doing fine. Yeah. 
and keep, keep enjoying that keep could, enjoying the history and could someone potentially take offense like you said yes 0.0001% of the population who happens to know something might say something because they have a bee in their bonnet right it is what it is yeah you're not going to change their mind no matter what so don't try just smile nod and move along right indeed wash day yes cheers good luck mr mac see there you go cheering you give, give another oh, test there mr mac <laughs> <That's true. laughs> cheers garachki <laughs> so now i'm just going to end every question <laughs> with, with cheers. cheers exactly the uh so it's now canon. i'm picturing the mclarens and mcgregors as the hatfields and mccoys now in my well, head. they were Scottish. Straw hats and, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know the Hatfields and McCoys were Scottish. Were the Hatfields? I thought I know they the were. McCoys were, but yeah, I thought they, they were. Yeah, have. they were yeah. Scott. I think they were Scott, Scottish or Scots Irish. I don't know, but they make some pretty awesome hot dogs now. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll forgive them. It's fine. Yes. Um. Well, I guess. Yep. About that time. Good time. Hey. Ba -ba -ba. So is that better? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Our ambassador today is Mr. Wade Smith. Wade lives with his wife, four chihuahuas, and two cats in the great province of Nova Scotia. He's the lead public safety officer for a community college campus up there. Wade's got a pretty cool heritage story. His uh, ancestors were members of Clan Chatton. In fact, he is a descendant of the great Henry Wind. Also known as Gal Crom or Crooked Smith in English, Wind was a great swordsman who fought for Clan Chatton against the Camerons in the infamous Battle of Kelty. Study your clan history, folks. That's where you get these really cool stories from. Now, Wade's direct ancestors immigrated from Dundee to Glasgow in 1852. They then resettled across the Atlantic in Chester, Nova Scotia, where one of them started a school. They've basically been there ever since. Wade is a nerd for Gallic history and Gallic language. Now, his other passion, as you may have guessed, is Highland dress. Now, he'd only ever worn a kilt for pipe and drum parades in high school, but then in 2019, he wore one for his wedding, and he hasn't looked back. I, for one, am grateful for his addiction, because as you can see, Wade is a master of traditional style. In a word, gentlemanly. The thing that helped Wade the most in his quest for style was kilt enthusiasts online. He also poured over historical references, art, and photos. He says, I find that pictures speak volumes, especially in terms of dress. I couldn't agree more. I asked Wade what heritage means to him today, and he said, It's more important now than ever. The Gallic culture is shrinking, and it's folks in the online groups who are going to be instrumental in preserving it. Wade's advice for newbies out there getting started? Take it slow. Don't fall for those special deals when you're shopping. And essentially, do what he did. Stay involved with the online groups where you can see a large variety of styles and meet folks with experience. That's basically the best way to avoid being led down the garden path into something you're not going to be happy with. And we're back. So, that was so, our friend, Mr. Wade Smith. Yes. A traditional kilter of the highest degree. Very, very interesting fellow and a very nice guy. Very sharp. Indeed. Very, very sharp. Yeah, very good dresser. Yep. I like him. Yep. Cool. Here's to you, Wade. Indeed. Cheers. Cheers. Slancha <laughs> va. Turning a new. A lot more toasting. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Mr. It's Mac. Max turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this one came in through Facebook. And this was a from Scott. And he's been pondering this from the other day. He's wondering, what is the history of the kilt pin? Ah. The history of the kilt pin. Ah, yes. The kilt the, pin. Yes. The kilt pin. Indeed. Now, does, is he, the... does he mean any kilt pin or the, the original kilt pin, which has been lost to history? Yes. The skirt they pin? So they didn't put a rubber band on the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, see, now i got to explain that. For those who don't know, if you have a kilt pin... When you stab it through your kilt, take a little chunk of rubber band or an eraser off a pencil or something yeah. and stab that pin through the eraser and then stick it out through the front of the kilt. And if your kilt pin comes undone, just like that, yeah. um, then it won't fall out of the kilt. Yeah. If the clasp, if the rotary clasp comes undone. Yes. Now, uh, <clears throat> more and more pins now have uh, butterfly clips 
instead of the pin, so it's yeah. not as much of a problem. But so, where did the kilt pin come from, Eric? Well, the apocryphal story is that it was basically mandated by Queen Victoria because she was reviewing troops once at Balmoral, and the kilt flaps. Not sorry, people exposing themselves, but they were just like going fluff, 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 fluff while the troops were on parade. And she found it unseemly and unappealing, and therefore she said, put a pin on it, as opposed to put a ring on it. Put a pin on it. Um, I think that's probably urban folklore. Um, we do know that uh, kilts did not necessarily have what we can, you know, the hip straps and stuff originally. And if you look at old photographs, uh, pictorial evidence from the 19th century, you will see that they are wearing pins higher up, like more on the thigh. Um, and I believe that what was happening was they were using these pins to affix the apron higher up in order to keep it from, you know, flopping fully open and just looking stupid. So it was a securing system at that time, um, and they would go through both layers. This is, you know, my, my educated guess. I've never seen the inside of somebody wearing a 19th century kilt. Possibly. See the They're holes. wearing it up that high, yeah. Um, we'll have to go to Scotland, do some research on this. Indeed. But, um, to the Batmobile, became... let's go. Yeah. Wait, we're going that. Oh, it's that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, door. the, um, <laughs> Dive out it's obsolete chairs. doing, doing that is obsolete. And now kilt pins are basically just a wind weight and a decoration. Um, you do not put a kilt pin through both layers of the kilt. You're more likely to damage your kilt if you do that. Um, now there is a, there's a transition phase where you had, uh, hip ties and Mac can tell us about, you know, some of the stuff they use. You know, militarily, speaking. militarily, they had the the big uh, the diaper pin blanket pins, which were used for the same thing of keeping a kilt closed, and sometimes also like keeping um, the over aprons that they wore closed. I think no, this is no, they didn't really put pins through those, did they? No, okay. just but ties. they but just the but yeah. So again, functional, you know, and again, a blanket pin was not. I don't think it was issued for that purpose. It's just they had blanket pins and they started using them to help keep the kilts closed. Mac, I'm looking at Mac like he's. He's not paying any attention. I can't tell whether he's paying attention, reading answers, or... I'm uh, doing or a thinking. combination of, of multiple things. He's just like, eh, yeah, 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 whatever. But yes, you were saying about the... Uh, the the, I heard blank, about the blanket the, pins. Blanket pins being used, yeah, I have a giant, big blanket pin mm -hmm. um, that I use on my for my War One kilt. But were they issued with those for the kilts, or were they... I didn't think so. Okay. No. Yeah. It was just like, you know what? I need this to be more closed. Than it is, so I'm going to use this pen. Is I mean, that... you're wearing most times they're wearing um, uh, kilt covers, um, which are the cotton wraps that go over top of everything. Mm -hmm. um, or, but they're also being sent back in different times of the year. They're being sent back to be laundered. So they even even though you're a Highland troop, you're not always wearing kilt. Sometimes you're wearing your your reissued trousers at different points. Mm. So your kilts are being sent back. They're being laundered, they're being repaired, coming back to the front. So all that stuff's going to be taken off. So it's, you're going to have pins, they're going to manufacture your own stuff out there sitting around in the trench. Trench art, yeah. So it's. But it was, but it was, but they did have a, they did pin them all the way through to help keep the, the aprons together. Is that correct? Do you know? Or were well, they using I the wouldn't say for 100% certainty on that, but. I, if, if the ones I've seen that have been pinned all the way through are ones that don't have straps or buckles. Okay. Yeah, that's, it was more functional than, yeah, than wind yeah. weight because a, a diaper yeah. pin kind of thing. Right. Like the three inch diaper pin is kind of what we're talking about. Um, those aren't, they don't weigh anything to be able to hold yeah. it down. Um, so yeah, it would, it would, it, it was, would make it sense. Closure mechanism. Functional. Yeah. But again, you don't see that. Uh, the Victorians gentleman is often it's very it's round. It's not like we traditionally think of as like a long sword kilt, shape. Yeah, know, sword shape or whatever. So yeah, it went from being a minor convenience kind of a thing to like, oh that looks really cool. Let's turn it into a thing. Yeah. Basically. Agreed. And it kind of navigated south over time. Correct. Yep. It, but yours there's no real kilt pins prior to the nineteenth century. Yep. That I'm aware of. So Agreed. Mr. Eric. Yeah. To kill pins. Indeed. Kill pins. <laughs> yeah. Launch. Let me refill. All right. I'll switch to coffee. 
Dun, dun, dun. Okay, here's another technical how-to one. <clears throat> Mark Essery! What's Mark, up? Mark Essery. This is a simple question, but might take a little explaining. Okay. Is there a trick to knowing where to position the kilt on your body initially so that it is in the right place overall once the buckles are secured? In other words, like side-to-side -side <laughs> positioning. Um... I feel like I always have to twist it around one way or the other to be able to secure the buckles. And then to get squared up, I have to, you know, twist things back. And then my shirt's all askew like this. You know, is there a way to, is there any tricks to doing that better? So you're not dealing with the, the whole yeah. twisting. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, and especially <clears throat> like, I think the thing that's really annoying him the most is this. It's like your shirt winds up in like this. Yep. So is there any way to avoid that? Um, Mark, just before the show... I was annoyed by my kilt and my sporn and my belt buckle not being straight on the gig line. <laughs> Why is my shit all fakakta? Ah. So, no, there's really not. You end up twisting and rooching around and kind of moving around so that you look presentable and look, you know, symmetrical right, left, and center. Um, if you are wearing a polo shirt with no buttons down here, it's a lot easier than if you're wearing a dress shirt with buttons all the way straight down. Um, the... Is there a way to connect the kilt so that you do it once, boom, done, and you don't have to think about it? In in you know, <laughs> nineteen twenty years of wearing kilts, I haven't found it. Um, I would say this: if I'm wearing a dress shirt, uh, what I would tend to do is when I put the kilt on, I would put it up a little bit higher, and I might leave the dress shirt kind of like poofed up up top. And then I can like twist okay. the dress shirt on like, you know, put the kilt on and then hopefully get it as, as aligned as I can. And then, uh, twist the kilt a little bit to the right position and then reach up underneath and pull the shirt down or pull it this way or pull it that way. Yeah. You know, depending on which way the button, the plackets on the buttons needs to be lined up. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, once I have it lined up, then, you know, drop the kilt down a little bit more into position. Um, if I was really fussed about it, I would do that. Otherwise, I've kind of gotten, uh, I won't say lazier, but, you know, over time, it's just a matter of you just deal with it. So wrap a kilt around and, you know, put it on that way. Put it on the buckles on this side. You just look at yourself in the mirror. Okay, does it line up? No. Okay, I reach down, pull the stuff this way, you know, you know, shift it around a little bit. Boom, done. Yeah, I'm afraid there really isn't a super magic secret trick. No. <clears throat> I basically just, you know, it, it depending on your body shape and how big a belly you got, this is going to be more of a nuisance than not for some people. But, yeah, I'm always a little bit twist at least, you know, to get the buckles on and then spin it back. And then I will basically just reach up underneath the kilt and pull the shirt back down to align it, which I think is what most people realistically yeah. wind up doing. It also partially you know? depends on how flexible you are. Um, if you can, like, if... If twisting your body all the way around to this side to adjust the buckle and then all the way around to this side doesn't bother you, great. If you're less flexible and you can only really get to like here, then you're going to have to like twist the kilt and, you know, pull it back that direction. One of the things we actually tell uh, bigger customers in the store who don't have necessarily the flexibility to be able to get all the way around is basically start with your left side buckle here, attach it through twist the kilt this way, attach your other buckles right here, and then twist it back, and then, you know, adjust the shirt and adjust everything else underneath. Yeah. That's pretty standard. Part of part of the game. Unfortunately, you have to suffer for your art. Yep. Pretty small much. Degree. Pretty much. Indeed. Mr. Mac. I, I'm laughing every, and you're talking about, that, about the flexibility. I was like sweating in my office trying to buckle. Uh, <laughs> I was like, "Come on, come on, fatty, you can bend a little bit more." Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, Matt gets halfway up the stairs and has to take a break. It's... Ouch! <laughs> Ow! You guys are mean. Uh, I'm mean to myself. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah. I like... dude, I get winded. <laughs> we have stairs in the shop, and it's not like one flight; it's like a flight and a quarter. So it's like those extra six steps at the very yeah. top. Yeah. <sighs> And it's steep too. It's like an Aztec pyramid. You know, I always joke about that. And it's like, blah, roll the body down the steps. Yeah, like, but that's what happens when you retrofit a building to put a freaking media studio in it. You know? yeah. Come to the crypt of Tutankhamun. <laughs> Ray, 
Usakilts. Usakilts. Yes, Usakilts. The tomb of Usakilts. The tomb of Rager Common. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mr. Mac. So we got a question coming from the TikToks again. Nice. Oh, thank you. Um, asking, are you guys going to this little festival called Kelda Classic this year? That thing? <laughs> that old thing? Ah. Um, what? Of course what? we are going to Kelta Classic. Yeah, we'll be there. <clears throat> um, Funny Kel- you would mention that. Just don't spoil it. <gasps> I'm going to spoil don't, it. Oh, I know. It's already spoiled now. Damn it. <laughs> cat's out of the bag. Um, Celtic Classic is one of the larger, if not largest. Um, they're all, the funny thing is about Celtic festivals or Irish festivals or Scottish like They all want to be the largest of right. something. Right. So it's the largest Celtic Games festival in the earth. I don't know. It's big. It um, is pretty big. It's up in Bethlehem, PA. It's the last week, last full weekend of September every single year. Yep. Um, Last year, we were supposed to, didn't get to, because they kind of pulled it back. But this year, this year, bum, bum, bum. these guys right here, this guy, and this guy. Over um, there. No, not Mac. Oh, well, he's going to yeah. be helping. He's going to be at the He's going to be at the event. Um, But we're going to do a Kilts and Culture live from Kelta Classic. Um, <clears throat> It's going to be me and Eric. On an actual stage at an actual time yep. with an actual audience yep. Yep. asking actual questions because these are actual. We're, we're going to ask them questions. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the tables. <laughs> so, <laughs> you. You with the purple shirt. What are you doing? Uh, no, but seriously, it's going to be awesome. Yep. <clears throat> this is the first time we're going to be doing something with a live studio audience, so to speak. Um, so it's going to go off the rails. We have no idea if it's going to be good or horrible. If you see a video, let's say mid October, that is put out on YouTube, it means it was good. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't see any videos, then it never happened. What are you talking about? There was no <laughs> plausible the deniability. Exactly. I was in Austria during the festival. <laughs> <laughs> now, but if you're in the you know Philadelphia, New York kind of region corridor, whatever it is, please plan to go to Celtic yep. Classic. We need people there to ask us yep. questions live. Yep. We are not going to be broadcasting it live because we're not sure about the, the Wi-Fi and all that kind of stuff right. at the event. But we're going to be answering questions live. We're going to have a meetup. We're going to be hanging out, drinking, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So please plan to be there. Yes, we're going to be there. Yes, USA Kilts will have a booth there. It's going to be a rock and roll party, kick-ass blast extravaganza. Yeah, but we, we always have a booth there. Um, it's yeah. one of the only festivals that we do. Um, and we have a lot of friends there. Um, so it's kind of home. Uh, but yeah, this will be the first time we're actually doing a live show. So if you do come, be aware you could wind up being recorded for posterity, whether posterity can handle it or not. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's been nervous. Like, oh, what are we going to do if nobody shows up? And I've been telling him, I've been telling him, no, we're going to have plenty of people. It could be a problem. <laughs> There's going to be people. We will fill the tent. I promise. So don't make a liar out of me, please. Tell yes. your friends. Come on out for it. You know. And Rocky, you have 8x10s glossy that he can sign after for everybody? No, I'm, that's, I'm, si- no, I'm that's signing. That's pretentious and stupid. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm signing no. people's chests. Che- okay. Hopefully there's not a lot of hair that, I, that, the, that the pen has to go through. But, yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> Sweaty men. But we, but we do hope we'll be able to talk to people a little one-on-one also, in addition to doing the the, the, yeah. the official show. No, that's so, part of but... what we love. We love interacting with people yeah. in real life or in real camera life. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it's you know, the actual physical interaction mm-hmm. at events in the store. That's what gets our juices going. Yep. So please come out. Please hang out with us. <laughs> please. No. No, um, nah, it'll be a good time. Yeah. Yep. Be there. Be there. Be there. Be there. Or be or something. octagonal. I don't know. Yeah. Indeed. All right. Ray? Sure. Why don't you go? Okay. Go. And go. Uh, now I got stage fright. Uh, Matthew Newman asked, very simple but complicated question, how do pipe bands or military regiments choose their tartans? Sometimes it's not really a choice, actually. But Military regiments, I'm not, not sure. Not really much of a choice. Um, yeah, how they, how they select them. Um, you Mac might be able to. I think I know what the answer is. I'd be happy to hear what Mac it, says. It dep- I, nowadays, I don't know. I know in the olden times, 
um, it, basically whoever fronted money. There's a lot of it right. was all right. Was all Fair. this guy? He fronted the money for it. So, yep. It's okay. basically whoever raised the regiment. It was their yeah. choice. Sometimes it was their clan tartan. Um, but private it's... army like the Murray of Athol's like coming to mind. I remember them walking through with the different, slightly different, played color than kilt color. But yeah, that's There's different. They're special. Yeah. You mean the the, the archers? Private army. No, or the, no, the the, the Highlanders. The yeah, Ath- yeah. Murray of Athol Highlanders. Yeah. yeah, that's different. Yeah, the only <clears throat> the only standing private army in modern world or something like something that. like that yeah, yeah. But, um but yeah military regiments it, um a lot of them go back a long time um and it goes back to 18th century uh early 19th century uh the regiment being raised usually by uh a person of some rank and uh, uh note uh, of the nobility or the aristocracy and it was basically either their clan tartan or a tartan that they liked um that became the unit's tartan and it's part of the tradition of the of the regiment so you don't really change it um un- until or unless it's the regiment amalgamated. is amalgamated or disbanded um i just did a little bit of research on the 78 uh, of foot highlanders and um yeah so it's exactly that they so we're gonna pre- probably gonna do a whole little smv video on those but um uh yeah the, you don't change it's like the colors of the regiment you know what i mean so it's like it's storied it's part of the tradition. It's part of the esprit de corps. So once yeah. it's set, you don't it's part want of the history. to change it. Yeah. yeah. Now for pipe bands, that's a different story. There's, <clears throat> there are pipe pipe bands can pick their tartan. You know, they're they're yeah. think of it this way. Put yourself in their position. It's a group of you know guys. You know, and with <laughs> a, a a a piping band with a or a drinking band with a piping problem kind of thing. <clears throat> a, a group of guys come together or girls and say, all right, we're gonna start a band. What tartan are we going to do? So, there are different ways to go at it. Um, some bands will say, well, you know, uh, I know like uh, Kilnave. Uh, McConnell was the founder of the band. So, he said, great. You know, or the band said, okay, we're going to adopt the McConnell tartan as our bagpipe or as our bagpipe band's tartan because that was the founder of the band. Mm-hmm. So, that's how a lot of bands start. There are some bands that just kind of have a democratic process, like Brian Baru, who said, you know, they broke off from a different brand, from a different band, and they said, okay, well, we're an Irish band. Let's look at one of the Irish County Tartans, and they selected County Mayo because they like the colors of that particular Tartan. Right. There's other bands that start that say, well, we want to have our own Tartan, so they're going to design their own, so they have their own Tartan officially registered and that kind of thing. So there are different ways for bands to come at it. It is generally, generally speaking, it's either a democratic process where the band members vote on which tartan that they are going to do, or if they're going to design their own tartan, or it's done to honor a founding member or an idea or something like that right. is how the kind of the, the tartan gets chosen for the band. I think they're always voting in a more or less democratic fashion, but it's a question of what is their inspiration for their options. So you might have it in the in the running, like, okay, we could either go with, you know, this tartan because it was Joe's tartan and he's the one who started the band, or we could do this tartan because it's the state tartan, you know, like the 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 band up in Alaska that uses Alaska state steel, um, or we could invent one that we feel we can put symbolism into the colors, like uh, Philadelphia Police and Fire. Their tartan is. I think probably there's like, like, I designed it for them based on the uh, Federal Memorial Tartan. Gotcha. Um, but they came to us and said, we want a Tartan based on Federal Memorial, but we want to, you know, tweak it a little bit to make it our own. And we did that for them. Yeah. There's also, yeah, there's a bunch of different ways to kind of come at it and make it their own. But especially nowadays, meaning 2022, 2023, 2019, more and more pipe bands are kind of thinking about it going, well, if we have like 15 or 16 new members and we have to buy essentially a bolt of cloth anyway, why would we just buy Royal Stewart when for the same amount of money we can have our own woven? So let's design our own tartan and do our own thing so that we're different from right. the other bands that do Royal Stewart that's already out there. Yep. Yep. So yeah, it's it's a it's a neat tradition and it's a neat and, and well even even beyond that some bands will say especially if they don't have much money or the individual members are buying their own kilts no you buy your own tartan and it's just kind of like a hodgepodge 
of different tartans right. on all the pipers. Right. And you get the rainbow effect. Yep. Yeah. There's a uh, Collingdale that was police and fire who wore our law enforcement and our firefighters tartan together. Um, so there, there's a there's neat ways to go about it. There's neat symbolism within it. It's you're you're peeling back layers of the onion to kind of get at the the center of it. But there's there's a lot of neat stuff. Um, generally speaking, involved in how they select a tartan. There's not one way, there's multiple ways to do it, but there's generally symbolism behind it. Yep. Very much. Indeed. Ta -da. Mr. Mac. All right. So this comes from YouTube, from Old River Couch. Old River Couch? Yes. <laughs> now I'm picturing an old beat-up couch by the banks of the river. Mm -hmm. Got it. And okay. Kermit the Frog is on it. Yes. Yeah. Why are there so many <laughs> songs about tartans? <laughs> yeah. Not easy to be a green tartan. <laughs> it's not that easy being Campbell. <laughs> okay. He's asking, what should kilt strap tension be? I usually make the top two straps fairly snug and the bottom one fairly loose. I just guessed on how the how it should be. Is this correct or does it or does it not matter? I think it sounds that's what I would do. Yeah, it's yeah. there there's 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 different schools of thought. Yeah, yes, they're all yeah, on yes, kilt tension. Yes. Um there there's a couple different ways to do it. One, when you're when you're a kilt maker making a kilt, you want all three straps to be on the same hole. So ideally, if your left you know your your left side you know waist strap and your right side waist strap are on, they should both be about on the middle hole, and then the hip strap should be on the middle hole as well. Um, what I generally do for, for a little bit smoother effect as you stand is my under apron, I will pull a little bit more snug, mm -hmm. and then the over apron, the front apron on top, I will leave probably either one hole or about the same hole as the under apron, just to kind of, so that it, the under apron is snug, kind of holds me in, and the other one just kind of lays more gently across the front of me. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I always, I pretty much always the same hole for the waist for me. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, generally do, speaking, it's about the same hole. I do like to have the, 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 the third strap a little looser, though, just for mobility and sitting down. Yep, and some people think that the third strap, or the third strap is uh, somewhat superfluous. You don't actually yeah. need it. You can leave that off. Yeah. Um, We've done that for on occasion. If people say, hey, leave the third strap off on the hip. I don't really want it. That's fine. We can do that. Right. Um, but it's it does kind of, in some ways, balance out the left side of the apron where the fell is sewn down to, you know, about the hip measurement on the left-hand side. So that kind of balances it out a little bit on the right. Mm -hmm. Although it's not 100% actually needed to hold the kilt in place. It just kind of keeps the apron centered, so to speak. Right. No, the goal is to have it not fall off you. That's it. That is, well, so. not fall off and look good. Right. Yes. Right. Those two things. Yeah. Two goals. Yeah. And pleats in back. So. Two, Eric. Two. 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 All right. Mr. Mac, was that you? Or was that? All right. So, Eric, you're up, pal. All right. Um... Okay, another practical question. Uh, Don Burns says, I wear a 9-yard, 16-ounce wool kilt. After an all-day hot weather festival, what I'll do is spread it out, underside up, on a long table overnight to allow the sweat to evaporate from the fabric. Is this a good idea, or would it be better to immediately hang the kilt when I get home to keep the pleats straight and uniform? So, is he, is he going to encourage his plate... Should you lay it plate? flat... Or hang it. Yeah, is he going to lay it flat to let it dry out, or is he going to hang it so that he's uh, his pleats are not softening, <clears throat> losing their crisp edge? Um, I would. There, there's advantages to both. If you hang a kilt, you have you know air circulation in front and back. Now that said, so if you're like, well, it's you know air attacks it from both sides attacks. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're laying it flat with the inside facing up, that is where the majority of your sweat is. Yeah. So it can gas off and kind of the air will lift the, the you know, the moisture out of the kilt. But. Um, I would say the bigger, the actual bigger issue is if you hang the kilt, depending on how many 
you know, clips you have going across the top of it. Um, you have the unfortunate situation where the kilt, if you're hanging it by like, let's say two clips, you can end up with pleat splay or the pleats just kind of, you know, spread out in a weird way. Mm -hmm. And then especially if your kilt is wet and you do that, it kind of gets in a weird shape and then you're really should probably iron it to get it back in the proper position next time you put it on. Um, it's kind of, it's stretching the wool in a weird way. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Mac, you can kind of, uh, as a as a kilt maker yourself, you young man, um, you can kind of come in here if you have any thoughts on this as well. I'm, I'm just trying to think of, like, after festivals, after we're out in the festival all day long, and sweating out there. It's moist. Yeah. yeah. Yep. In, on the inside, definitely. Yep. Um, the... Uh, <laughs> I think the first thing to do is kind of just lay it out on the, like the lay it out on kind of on the bed just to kind of yeah at least air it out there, but then putting it on two hangers where you can kind of separate a little bit. Now we're spoiled by having really good hangers. Yes, we have the four clip hangers. So um, yeah, I would Cheap say you can buy it today. Must be eighteen or older to call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, available at the usakills.com store, folks. Um, but no, if you have like a four, you have two kill hangers, you can put them side by side, and you can hang it. I kind of get the best of both worlds. Yeah. I don't like the I don't like hanging it on one hanger when it's wet because you're trapping that moisture on the inside. The the, the layers are folded on the inside. Agreed. Um, don't I've, do that. I've been known to lay a kilt out on a hotel air conditioner for that same reason. I was like, Whoop. I'll lay it on the back of the chair, like the wing or the chair, or the back of a chair. Yep. Because mm -hmm. yep. that way yep. it kind of like it's especially if it has those two little like the wings that you know come in a little bit. That way you have a little bit of underneath air. Mm -hmm. Um, and it kind of like yeah. hangs down the side, but the pleats are kind of supported straight down. Yeah. Didn't you also yep. use the uh, I'm trying to remember from festivals where we've all the the rack? The... Yep. Yep. One of those the the oh, yeah. collapsible clothing rack kind of yeah. things. Yeah. Clothes you can racks use are good. that, so you can put it across the top of that, and then air can go top and bottom on it yeah. as well. But I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with what he's doing. It's, no, it's it's really so. the question becomes the maintenance after the fact. Correct. If he wants to, like, it's when when you have like, when you have something wool and wet and it's kind of hanging at a weird angle, when it dries, it will be stiff or at that weird angle. So if you're going to re-iron it, sure, great, done. But if you don't want to re-iron it before the next time you wear it, like if you're going out for right. three days in a row at a festival and you're wearing the same kilt, then you want to lay it as flat as possible for it to gas off versus hanging it where it's going to kind of splay out right. weird. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. If if space allows, I think it's a fine technique because you're you're just putting off the next time you have to iron the kilt. Yep, it's gonna need ironing eventually. But yeah, exactly. Because we're used to we're used to that situation where it's basically a three day trip or more. So. And if you sweat enough, it'll eventually need to be washed when it stands up that. by itself. <laughs> There's that. You yeah. should probably <laughs> yep. dry clean or, or wet wash your kilt. Yep. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. <laughs> Don't let go. the kilt wear you. You wear the kilt. Remember that. <laughs> Mr. Mac, the more you know. All right. So this is an interesting one. This comes from Facebook from Carl. What colors do you recommend for a color a colorblind person to use when designing a tart? Gray. I suggest you have someone help you with choose the colors. Um it well, well colorblind or not, it's it really depends on the color palette that you're choosing. Do you want an ancient general color palette or to stay safe with it if you have a an issue seeing the colors then i would stay within the color palette whether it's ancient colors whether it's modern colors whether it's weathered colors it's already a tried and true color palette so i would probably stick with that if you have that issue you know kind of looming over you hmm. yeah i think like a i think you just made yeah exactly exactly now that now I was gonna say um, more scotch. <laughs> probably not. Um, if there's a tartan you like, that you like the colors of, and you like how the colors blend, then that could be your template, and just say, okay, this tartan calls for this, 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 and this. So I'm gonna take those and use those to color, you know, to make my design. That way, I can be pretty sure that even if I'm not seeing them the same way other people see them, I know I have a pleasing combination. So basically, using what exactly what you said, but saying use a current tartan as a template for the palette you're going to choose not just the 
type of color palette, as in ancient, weathered, or muted, or whatever, but these specific six colors, you know, and then <clears throat> and build your design that way. It's always good to get a second pair of eyes on a tartan design, whether you're colorblind or not. So, you know, have, have somebody who can look at it with you and say, well, you know, you might want to consider changing that up or whatever. Um, and focus on whether you like the contrast more than anything else. Um, it's, if, you, if you're if you not seeing the difference between reds and blues or reds and greens, then maybe you don't use so many reds and greens, but you want to make sure you have a pleasing contrast so that you can enjoy it. Yeah, you there's know? actually a uh, <clears throat> uh, yes, 100%. B, ask someone you trust, like, hey, I really like the way this tartan looks. Is this a good looking tartan? Maybe ask a couple people right. who have independent, you know, color vision that can see it. And one of the things that, you know, exactly what you just said, we actually did. Um, Dr. Tullock is a, a customer, a friend of ours, and he had, he wanted me to design a tartan. And he said, I love the County Dairy tartan from House of Edgar. Okay. So I love the interplay of those particular colors. Okay. So I want you me to design a tartan for him or for me whatever i forget where i am in the in the thing but anyway <laughs> design a tartan using the county dairy colors period so we kind of i just figured out and talked to the mill said okay what specific shades of green blue orange whatever are you using in this particular tartan and then we designed a tartan for him using only those colors yeah and made sure it's the exact same color palette and we just had the same mill weave it and he's very, very pleased with the finished product. Yeah. And that's kind of a, a very astute observation, and that worked for him as well. Mm -hmm. Mac, you had something else? Yeah, um, it might be a good idea, especially for some newer people that are watching for the first time. If you can just quickly, I know we've done oh. it in other videos, but ancient, uh, modern, <clears throat> weathered, muted. Sure. Right. What are the color palettes? Yep. Sure. A, uh, generally, when you're talking about tartans, um, Clan tartan specifically, not necessarily the modern universal ones that are going to, you know, call on different colors or different shades of the same color and that kind of thing. But going back 100, 200 years, particularly clan tartans, like the one that I am wearing here, this is the McEwen Modern Tartan. I'm calling it modern because it's using navy blue, bottle green, scarlet red, and a, a bold yellow kind of color. If this were to be an ancient McEwen Ancient, this navy blue would be like a light sky blue. This green would be a light grassy kind of green. The red would be more of an orange kind of color, and the yellow would be a little bit paler. In a modern, or excuse or me, weathered. in a muted, muted tartan like Eric has on here, the red is not scarlet red. It's more of a, a blood red. The green is more of an olive green. A blue would be like a stormy sky blue. Weathered tartans would have the blue become sort of a steel gray kind of color. The greens would become a brown. The red would be like a salmon-y kind of red. And the yellow would be a very pale, goldish kind of yellow. Um, so it's a color palette based on the tartan. Now, it's the same tartan because the thread count is the same. The definition, a thread count is defined, or a tartan is defined by its thread count. So the thread count is the exact same it's just the color variations of green or of blue or of red are a little bit different depending on the color palette yep does that make sense <clears throat> does that help you out there mr mac yep. since you needed some help <laughs> figuring out what a modern and ancient color making well, there was a question on there so that's why i'm brought it up I'm I'm kind of disappointed that you've been here for you know <laughs> like 12, 14 years now, Mac, and I have to explain this to you over and over and over. Well, at least the mills sometimes label the material when it comes in. That's the only way you've gotten by, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. And cheating us this whole time. Wow, wow. <clears throat> you sure you want him to be on the five-year anniversary special? No, I'll I'll put him in back there with him to help him out. Okay, okay. August nineteenth, five-year anniversary special, right here, this channel. Same kilt time. Same kill channel. Yeah. Yep. yep. Indeed. Mr. Eric, is that you or him? That was him. Okay. Good. You. Next. Go. Go. Move down. Move down. Okay. Eric Stubbs is trying to stump us. He said, uh, I thought that I had read that one of the reasons for great kilts coming on the scene was to avoid a garment tax since there was no sewing involved with making a great kilt. 
But I couldn't find anything online to confirm this. Is there anything true about this story? Mm, I've no. never heard that. No. I've never heard that at all. The um, <clears throat> Great Kilts essentially preceded tailored kilts, so I wouldn't think that would be true. The only thing that is similar-esque um, what, that I know is true, uh, and I'll kind of go off on some you know, anti-government rants here for a second, so I apologize in advance. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> when kilts, like, 40 years ago-ish, were being exported from Scotland and imported by Americans or, you know, sent to America, one of the customs duties, one of the, the, the things you had to declare was, does your garment have any decorative edges, any, any frilly bits, any fringe, and those garments were taxed at a higher rate by customs. So one thing that uh, kilt makers did in the UK was the fringe on the edge of the front apron. They would actually leave that fringe, or they wouldn't fringe it. They right. would just cut the fabric right there. And you as the recipient would actually pull those threads out. So that would avoid the necessity for the garment to be taxed at the frilly, you know, uh, uh, embellished rate. Right. Um, Another weird thing like that, you know, again, you know, and, you know, here I am on my anti-government soapbox. The, one of the things that drives me nuts is upholstery fabric is taxed at a lower rate than garment fabric. So if I were to buy fabric from one of the mills in the UK and say like, hey, this is for upholstery, it's, I, f I forget the actual rates. I used to know them. It's like seven and a half percent versus 12 and a half percent. So it's the same freaking cloth but it's taxed at different rates depending on what it is going to you know the intended purpose of the cloth so maybe he's conflating something i don't know one of those uh, it's with kinda, that but it's i've never heard great kilts I've, being I've never heard that before it's it's kind of like untaxed i, I try to imagine some tax collector going up into the highlands at all but but you know, going up there I was like, you, you're wearing a shirt. <laughs> Give me money. I mean, it's like, no, it's, it's, it just, it, it feels like one of those, um, it, it feels like an urban legend designed to boost the underdog, um, which we have a lot of, and they are there for a reason. It's fine. Some of them are fun, but it feels like something somebody invented because there's like, you know, you know, another way of saying, you know, those damn English. It was like, it's also because I think, Sometimes it's hard for we in our modern minds to imagine the circumstances that would lead somebody to do something that seems low tech. You know, it's like like we don't we don't respond to all the things that would require you to adapt back in the day. You know, it's hard to hard to transpose your brain back to those times. It's like why well they had pants up until then. Why did they start wearing this garment? There must have been a reason they couldn't wear pants. Well, no, there was a reason they decided pants were not the best option for certain circumstances. Um, it's not, yeah, you know, there's not necessarily an overriding dramatic reason that's usually very simple, pragmatic reasons. Kiss. You know? Yeah. Keep it simple, stupid. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. So. Indeed. Yeah. So, no, haven't heard of that. Don't think there's anything to it. It's not a thing. Don't make it a thing. Right. It's not a thing. Yep. 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 Indeed. Mr. Mac. All right. Who do we got next on the interwebs? All right. So this comes from YouTube, uh, from Steven. It says, how do I keep my buckle from scratching the top of my sporn? Hmm. I got a stag buckle and an art artisanal sporn and worn for the first time last weekend. It had scratches on the top of the sporn apron. Now, is this a, when he says artisanal, does he mean, is this a flap closure or does it have a cancel? It's one of ours. It's the artisanal uh, brown and black sporn. Okay, but yep. I want it. A flap, day sporn. It is a flap. Yep. Okay, and what was the buckle, do you say? Uh, stag. 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 Stag sporn. Okay. Um, no, there's no good way to, it, it depends on how you wear your sporin and how you wear your buckle and your belt. If you wear your sporin a little bit lower when you sit down, it's really only when you're sitting. Um, when you sit down, like you look at me right now, my sporin and my belt are in pretty close proximity. When I'm standing up, they're three or four fingers breadth apart. Um, and when I, specifically when I'm doing the show, I loosen my sporin strap a little bit 
just so it can sit down a little bit further than I would actually do if I was out and about in the world. So it's one of those things where when you are, you know, when you're sitting down, you're, this is coming up and this is kind of sitting down. So they're, they're running into each other. So there's not a whole lot you can do to stop that. Would you disagree? Agree? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, there's the whole option of just, if you're going to be sitting for a long time, take this morning off. I may not be the answer that we want to hear, but it, it, yeah. uh, it's one way or turning the, turning the sworn to the side a little bit temporarily would be another way. Um, if you're really, really worried about it, then it may influence the design of the belt you wear or the buckle you wear with what sporin. You know, or like if, if you wear you, a belt if, at all. Or if you wear a belt at all. You know, if it's a very pointy, craggy, uh, three-dimensional design, you're more likely to have edges that are going to catch on the leather versus like something like the one I'm wearing today, which is smooth across the bottom. You know, but um, it kind of feels, a, you know, disappointing to have to limit your choices that way. Um, but yeah, there isn't really a good... I it, There isn't a good solution... Yeah. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. Uh, stop. Zoom to it. Um, I will say this. This sporin that I am wearing right now is seven or eight years old, probably at this point. Um, I have beaten the absolute hell out of this thing. It has the more scratches you put on it, the more character it has, the more it looks, you know, well loved. So mm. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Because the more you wear it and the more, you know, flaws it has, that's the more, you know, battle scars and stories Prince that Charles. the Sporin has. Prince Charles. What about Prince Charles? He's a perfect example of that. That hunting oh. Sporin he has. Yeah, with the one torn tassel. Yeah. He's and been wearing the yeah. same hunting Sporin for like 50 years. And it's only gotten cooler yeah. as a result. So Absolutely. So it, having something brand new, pristine is great. I love having a brand new thing. But. There's also something, you, you go through a phase, uh, through a, a, a transition from loving the brand new thing because it's new and it's shiny and it's perfect, and then you get that first scratch or the second scratch or little imperfections on it, and then you get mm -hmm. angry because it's no longer perfect, but you love the thing so you keep wearing it, and then the more it gets beat up, the more you love it because it's beat up, mm -hmm. and it's now part of mm -hmm. your story, and it's part of you. Like, yep. if you look at videos from five years ago, I'm wearing this sporin for most of them because this is my favorite sporin. And I keep poking myself in the crotch and this looks weird on camera, but I don't care at this point. But <laughs> I'm wearing this sporin for most of those videos because I just love this sporin. So it's, you know, it's at some point, and I'm, this does not meant to sound harsh. At some point, you just have to go, well, okay, it's scratched now. Now I have to love it for being imperfect. Uh, I, you know those new docs I got? Yes. I just had the first scratch on the toe. Yes. And how do you feel about that? I'm pissed as hell. Yes, I am exactly. I so freaking pissed. <clears throat> and it's like, I knew it was going to happen eventually. Just kind of like looking down. It's like, oh, yep. You know. And when you start getting the, uh, the, in your Doc Martens or in your, your combat boots, when you start getting like the wrinkle lines across the, the, uh, the toes, yeah, I don't mind your, those your as much, feet but bend. the scratches bother me more than yeah. the wrinkle lines. But is there a way to, um, disguise the, if you have a gouge in a sporin, just for whatever reason, like you run into a, a knife. I would say I one knife. of one of two things. <laughs> you run into <laughs> just randomly. Is, is Someone it... tried to stab you in the crotch. <laughs> Thank God you had a thick lever artisanal sporin. <laughs> Insert product plug here. It must be eighteen or older to call. My lucky um, sporin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, like you could probably, I I would feel. Weird saying polish the leather or or re dye yeah. it or something like that because a it's going to take the dye differently b it's going to be rubbing against the kilt potentially yeah. and you don't want right. that to transfer onto the kilt right. that would be my biggest concern right but um maybe maybe I only want to say this but I'll say it anyway um, maybe needs foot oil or something like that where you can kind yeah. of you know make it a little more supple a little more prone to scratching but the more the more scratches it ends up getting the more character it has yeah within reason okay. you don't want to wear something that's like threadbare and it looks like you're you know 800 years old and you just haven't uh, taken this, care of it's it. kind of the reason There's why you have a certain amount of for character. special occasions and yeah day sports so i would say yeah i think some kind of a, uh an oil to because this the things about scratch that suck is the color contrast because that's how you notice it 
and the fuzzy bits sticking up. So if you can have a way to smooth that out a little bit, like with a, a little gentle rubbing with yeah. an oil to it, so that it absorbs into the the hide underneath the the finish of the leather, so it it, it darkens in color. You know yes, I mean? but his remember his is a I don't brown remember. and okay. He had the artisanal dace board. Show it here in case we haven't shown it yet. Um, his is the artisanal dace board. It's brown and black mixed. Yeah. yeah. So the brown, it's it's it being you know beating up a black spore and subtle marks are going to be easier to you know, notice less on a black spore hmm. than on brown because it's not hmm. like a super dark brown. It's a it's a tannish kind of brown. Got it. So it's a little more. I, I empathize a little bit more with you in that way. But it's just, it's part of the life of the spore and it's part of the life of anything that you wear, especially leather goods that you wear. You know, the belt that I've worn, you know, for, you know, 10 years has kind of a little bit of a U shape to it because that's how I'm built and that's just what happens. I've yeah. sweated in the belt, I've gotten it hot, and it's kind of now a little bit of a U. It is what it is. Right. I still love it. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> Missed that belt. All right. So sympathies. Yes, indeed. But don't worry about it. Frankly speaking, you're probably more concerned about it than anyone else. That's generally how things go. Eric notices his scratch at his Doc Martens. I didn't. I didn't care. I didn't think less of him for having a single scratch in his brand new boots. I won't think less of you, I promise. Mr. Eric. Is that my turn? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, H. Moore. Uh, who, by the way, was one of the people who uh, very kindly answered the question of the month last month. Uh, he had commented at the time, I'm 5'4". As a vertically challenged person, would a great kilt be too long for me? I love the look of it, but I would hate for it to be dragging on the ground. Is there... So, 5'4". Five, 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 okay, 5'4", five, five, four, four, wearing a great kilt. Is wearing a... a great kilt. Yeah. The cloth a great kilt is basically just double width cloth that you hand pleat and wrap around you whippity do da connect it up here um the different mills have different widths of cloth so i would start by saying if you're five foot four i would probably choose lock double width cloth because it's going to be about 54 inches wide versus something like house or excuse me uh martin mills which is about 60 inches wide so if you're a taller guy on the other end of the spectrum, I would lean towards, you know, Martin Mills. with see the other Strathmore is about 58 or 60. Um, so I would lean towards one of those to get a little bit more height out of it. Um, yes. Now, start with a mill with a slightly lesser width fabric. Get that. If it is still too long or it's, you know, it's hanging down below the knee, then you have essentially two choices in well three choices one suck it up and deal with it just fold the extra fabric a different way make sure it's hitting you mid knee and then fold the extra fabric up top a slightly different way unless he's wearing it modernly and just letting you it know, lay down letting it, yeah, do yeah. The, the tail thing um option two would be have the cloth hemmed it's never yeah it's never a great idea especially on a great kilt uh well i guess you could still iron it in but it's never it's never the, the, the best option to have something hemmed, but you can have it hemmed. Um, the third option, and again, none of these are necessarily great, would be to actually surge or, or use an overlock machine, cut the fabric to, let's say, you know, two inches less or whatever the appropriate length is, and then actually have that cloth cut and surged. Um, surging or overlocking, for those who don't know, if you look at like the inside edge of your t-shirt, where you have like a bunch of threads that wrap around the edge of the cloth, um, that is overlocking or surging, which is cutting off the, the fabric and then doing that, that thread that goes around the edge to just make sure it doesn't fray. Maybe doing that could do it, although you're going to have a line of stitching at the bottom of the cloth then. Um, so again, no great options. Great kilt options. No great options. Sorry, I had to. I'm so sorry. Um, but it's it's something that'll get a little bit more your length that you're desiring. Do you have any other? No, I think it's basically just you you need a smaller great kilt, yeah. basically. So yeah, you make it narrower by doing the trimming like he was discussing. Um, 
you could test what lengths are going to work best for you with some scrap fabric or something before you decide um, how to modify uh, your expensive tartan that you just bought um, from a reputable tartan dealer. Um, but yeah, you know, say get you know get some. I don't know if your wife is into quilting or something. Get some quilting cotton and you know figure out if you need it like you know 50 inches wide or 48 inches wide or what's going to work. Figure out the length and experiment with something that you don't care about until you feel like in the mirror you've got something you can wrap and drape and you get the nice cool tail on the back if you're yeah. doing the modern look or you got enough material to work with to do the over the shoulder thing or the over the head thing if you're doing a reenacting thing. Um, and then then purchase your tartan because you know having having to cut into expensive cloth to modify it can be scary so yep. just measure twice with something else and cut it several <laughs> times and then measure measure and cut once with the actual tartan agreed mr mac all right tiktoks again whoop, whoop. so we have zahara rose 30 did seps have their own tartans in the same way clans did Sometimes. Sometimes. Not always. They usually become clans in, of their own at that point. Yeah. yeah. Um, the uh, Asept is a <clears throat> uh, a clan that is associated with a larger clan. So either through marriage, through living on land, those kind of things, they would wear the tartan of the larger clan, of the the land that they live on, that kind of thing. Would you, would you have anything you would like to add, Mr. Eyebrow? cocked at me guy no he's right um basically um family names and families could become sept for a number of different reasons usually it would mean that you are swearing loyalty to a clan and therefore you're adopting the regalia of that clan so you'd be wearing their tartan or using their clan badge etc um when a sept became large enough or things were disorganized enough and communication was difficult enough between a sept and the leaders of the clan proper they might break off and become a clan of their own that's happened a few times um and that's kind of you know and then you have different renditions of clans happening just by geography itself you know like you know steward of appen versus steward of Ardshall and stuff like that they're still stewards but they consider themselves their own thing um i think the the whole idea of a sept becoming a clan and having its own tartan is more of a modern phenomenon i don't think it happened that often back in the day and realize that the existence of septs was there, but it wasn't a huge, dramatic segment of the kilt-wearing population. Stop me if you heard this one. Until the Victorians came along. Dun, and, dun, then dun. The, uh, and then basically everybody wanted to be a Highlander, and anybody who was in a clan wanted to have be able to lay claim to as many family surnames as possible because it was just it just made you look bigger and gave you clout and all that kind of stuff. So um, there was a huge push in the mid 19th century where clans were just scooping up names left, right, and center to say, okay, that's a sept of ours, and that's a sept of ours, and that's a sept of ours. And it's funny because sometimes you'll get into a situation where, like, your family name is a sept of like two or three or four different clans. <laughs> it's like, okay, which one is it? You know, turn it. You have to go into geography. It was a massive game of hungry, hungry hippos. A little bit. And they just had marbles bit. with clan names on them. Yep. Yeah. So um, it does occasionally happen. Um, not too often. Yeah. Yeah. Mac, did you have something to add? Are you? No, I was I was just picturing more of trading cards. Like, right. Uh, right. <laughs> I'll swap you Gotta catch them all. two yeah. reads yep. for one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For one Miller. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, how many Smiths you got? You know. And then I took the fish. Yeah. <laughs> then in my head, the leader of the pack song came on, and it was turned into leader of the clan. That's why I feel the leader of the clan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you have the bagpipes. Oh, going. No. <laughs> uh, I feel like the hungry. We hungry should bush. we should do a whole album of Filk songs. I mean, he just came up with one. We had one at the beginning of the show too. I forget what was the. Uh, we're horrible. We're, we're oh, dad no. jokes aplenty. <laughs> dad jokes and puns and filk songs. Yes. Oh my. Oh, wow. Kind of love the idea though. We could do that for the anniversary show, which is coming up on August 19th, by the way. Um. <laughs> Next, Mr. Eric. One more? We'll do one do more, for, one you, more for me? Okay. 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 All joking aside. 
Um, there was a, we actually have a video that we're working on right now, which talks about, um, not for the show, but for our company on how to choose your tartan. People are getting into this. And one of the things we talk about is what do you do if you're a sept or what do you do if you find your name listed for more than one clan? Um, so it's a good question. All right. Okay. Scott Kreckman has a problem. Dun, dun, Put on dun. your car talk guys, uh, hat for this one. Um, I'm trying to get my wife more into the tartan life. She's still getting used to me wearing a My Scott Modern kilt pretty regularly. Recently, I bought her a Scott Weathered shawl for Mother's Day. But what suggestions do you have to help her get into it more? So, <clears throat> you prepared to be a marriage counselor tonight? Me? Never. Man. Um, how do you get your wife to accept you wearing the kilt and get her into it. Sounds like she's okay with him doing his thing, but it's kind of like, yeah, go out there thing. Yeah, I I would say this. I wouldn't I wouldn't force it too much. It's the it is a all right, now I'm getting marriage counseling. Okay, my brain got it. <laughs> Clicked engage. Um it is it is very healthy for couples to do things together and to have common interests. It is also very healthy for them to have their own interests. Like, just because you're part of a union doesn't mean you need to do all the same things all the time. I go out twice a week and play deck hockey with a bunch of guys, sweat my butt off, you know, run around Mr. Fat Man, you know, throwing people into the boards. My wife has zero interest in watching me play. None. She, I come home, I stink, and she's like, oh, God, get upstairs, get... It doesn't matter because it's something I enjoy doing for myself. Do I wish she would say, like, I'd like to see you come play? Sure. It would be neat. I'd love to have my son involved and, like, you know, cheer me on. Go, Daddy, go. But it doesn't hurt my feelings that she doesn't want to because that's my thing. It's not her thing. Right. She likes to knit. I tried knitting one time and my brain just exploded with boredom. I don't want to do it. I don't care. <laughs> it, it takes me way too long to make a little thing. That's why I like sewing because I can do something faster. Knitting is just boring to me. Some people like it. Some people don't. That's fine. So I would, I would do the things that she or allow her to kind of come to it at her own pace. She's accepting of you doing it. She doesn't object to you doing it. So that's the that's the actual win her now convincing her to come into it is a little tricky you're you know you got her a sash great maybe see if she likes some some jewelry either it's irish or scottish or whatever you know see what you can twist on her existing interests to kind of draw her in a little bit see if she likes the music if you want to take her to a concert see if she'll go to a festival with you but don't like get upset or don't freak out if she doesn't care as much as you care because it's not her thing it's yours mm -hmm. and that's okay yep good night everybody now i, I seriously I'm not, I'm not sure what else to say basically um if she does not have a gallic background in her family she doesn't have an emotional draw to it the way you do then you can't force that on somebody um but if you can find occasions where it's fun I think everything is context driven, as we often say. So yeah, I think the idea of let's do this because it would be fun to do together for this special occasion. You know, I mean, don't don't try to like, well, like, oh, you're going out to the grocery store? Why aren't you wearing your tartan shawl? You're representing the family when you go to Giant, you know. So, Why don't you have Irish music playing in the car on the way to the grocery store? Yeah, no, that's it's, just, yeah, it's yeah. so um and yeah, my wife and I have some very different interests and, and we have a few interests in common. Um It'd be boring if we were clones, you know. Yeah. So anyway, I would say make it a special occasion thing. Make it a treat um, and make sure that she feels absolutely empowered to put her own spin on this. Um, if she does not have, if she does have some kind of Gallic background, that you know, see if she's interested in doing that. Maybe she wants to see if she's got her own tartan or something like that. Or maybe there's a story um, that intrigues her that has nothing to do with her family heritage, but, you know, something about the culture that she says, you know what? That's cool. Or, you know, oh, you know what? That that woman of history fascinates me. I want to learn more about her. Um, it could be something like that, that that is a hook for her, but it has to be on her terms and it has to be fun. You know, it's just, so find a way for it to be fun 
and absolutely totally temporary so she doesn't feel like you're locking her into some kind of a uniform and i would say so, you're there there may be an element of bargaining to some degree that you could utilize as well so if she you know likes the opera okay hey you know the maybe point out to her hey the opera you know you know les mis is in town next month uh, you know opera. can i whatever i don't know i don't like opera i don't know um <laughs> <laughs> the Johnny Cash Opera is in town next month. <laughs> no, but if there's something that she is interested in, maybe, you know, suggest like, hey, could I come to that with you? And start by, you know, don't start by asking, start by giving and say like, hey, I want to do, you know, a, li a couple little things that you're interested in. Now, you can't poo-poo it. You can't fall asleep during it. You can't, you know, get drunk during it. But show her that you are interested in her stuff and maybe she'll show a little bit of interest in your stuff. It's all about finding a balance and, and enjoying each other's things and each other's company and doing something for her because it's for her, not because it's for you. And, and she'll then, you know, hopefully reciprocate and do things for you just because it's for you. Does that make sense? Yes. Indeed. Good. My brain's going a completely different direction. <laughs> anyway. Indeed. All right. Boys and girls. Question of the day. Do we have any more announcements or anything for the question of the day? In case you didn't hear, we have no. a five-year anniversary show coming up August, August 19th. 19th. Be sure to tune in for that. Yes. Eastern Standard. But question of the day. What is your favorite Scottish food? Okay. We want to know. What's your favorite food? Why is it your favorite food? Oh, favorite and food? would you serve it to guests? Huh? Sure. How about that? Sure. Have you served it to guests? Right. Did you tell them that you were serving it to them? You're just like, you know, hey, eat this thing. <laughs> Let us know in the comments. Thank you, boys and girls, for tuning in. Until next time. Slanjava. Slanjava. Just do a half hour show. Keep it, keep it short. In the middle of the show, Rocky just gets up and throws his chair across the room. <laughs>